I want today to welcome everybody and today um, I will not speak a lot because everybody knows what happens. So, so it is Gita Talks and today we're speaking about the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. And with us, uh, our dear um, Shripad Mahayogi Prabhu, uh, he is a very interesting person who, who is on his spiritual path for more than 45 years. And so today he will tell us about the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Dandavats. Krishna. Om Ajnana Chamaranda Syagana Jana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Jena Tasma Shri Gurvena Maha Sarva Upanishadu Gavo Dugda Gopalanandana Bharto Vatsa Sudhir Bhokta Dugdam Gita Mritam Mahat Ekam Shastram Deviki Putra Gitam Eko Devo Deviki Putra Eva Eko Mantras Tasya Naman Jani Karma Pyekam Tasya Devasya Seva. <clears throat> so, well, I was told that uh, these talks would be introductory for people who have no idea about the Bhagavad Gita. But now I see that I'm speaking with very experienced uh, followers of the Bhagavad Gita. So it's a challenge for me to try to say something uh, interesting for them. Uh, I can say something new, but I don't know that that's really needed. Um, I think that the ancient wisdom is timeless. So it's all right if we say something that's already been said before. Well, it's very strange and confusing, the world that we live in today. Uh, our relationships, our personal relationships are, are difficult because of things like the coronavirus and isolation and quarantine. So it's difficult to have a, a meeting of friends, but at the same time, because of this new technology, we can bring people together from different parts of the world. So we have to have some patience with the technology. And what I was saying was the uh, Bhagavad Gita is a very deep book it's difficult for me to say something new. Uh, everything has already been said. And the people who are watching are certainly experienced students of the Bhagavad Gita. But I've been asked by Braja Sundari and some of you to try to speak on these things. And uh, I'll do my best. Perhaps uh, if I can get some mercy from the devotees that are gathered here, uh, I can say something useful. All right, so let's get started. If you look at the third chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, in a way, the message is very simple. Um, if the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is difficult because it contains many metaphysical ideas, the third chapter is actually simple in a way. It's simple because it talks about ethics. Now, if you look at the third chapter, Krishna describes seven main points of wisdom. And uh, most of these are touching on ethics. So you could say that he talks about ethics or how to live as opposed to all the metaphysical questions in the second chapter. In the second chapter, he talks about the soul. He talks about God, and he talks about the relationship between those. And he discusses what it might be to be an enlightened soul. But in the second chapter, he's talking about what to do and how to live. 
in this branch of philosophy we generally call ethics. And um, Krishna focuses on the idea of the sacrifice, or you could say giving back. Uh, we have been given many things. We need to give something back. And it's a very simple idea. I started this yendo, okay. Tercera uh, parte de Bhagavad Gita, el tercer capítulo, se trata de problemas éticas. O sea, en la filosofía tenemos la metafísica y también la ética. Si el segundo capítulo es enfocado en las metafísicas, el alma, el alma supremo. Y entonces, ah. en esta parte de Bhagavad Gita, estamos viendo cómo vivir, okay? how to live. So this is an ethical problem. Sacri the idea of sacrifice or giving back. Also, Krishna talks about the karmic circle. And that's a very interesting concept. Uh, a lot of times when we think about karma, we think of action and reaction. What goes up must come down. But, and so we look at our life and we try to find, what did I do? Why am I suffering now? Maybe I did something in the past or in my past life. Um, but we live in an organic world where action and reaction is not so simple. <clears throat> if, you, if you hit a ball on a billiard table, you can predict the velocity of the billiard ball and you can understand where is it going to go. That's physics. But if you plant a seed, you can't tell where the plant is going to grow. So karma is an organic thing. It's a little bit more like the seed and the tree than it is a baseball or a football that's moving, a moving object. Physics studies the actions and reactions of moving objects. But the idea of karma is more organic. So Krishna gives the example later on in the Bhagavad Gita of a banyan tree, which I find very interesting because the banyan tree, you have some in Mexico and in Florida, maybe you've seen these in Thailand, India. The tree grows up and then creates a branch. The branch goes down and creates roots. And from the roots, another tree grows. There is a very famous banyan tree in India. It's located in Haura, in the uh, Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose National Forest. And in that park, you can see here is a forest, but it's not a forest. It's really only one tree. It's one big banyan tree that has so many giant roots and branches and more roots and trunks that it looks like a forest. Well, karma is more like that. Uh, it's very difficult to find where's the root, where's the original root of some action, and where's the branch that grows from that. And Krishna explains this later in the Gita. Um, but in the third chapter, he deals with what is the proper position in terms of karma? In other words, what is work? And um, instead of thinking of a karmic circle then, you can think of it more as a banyan tree that's got uncontrollable growth. So these are the seven big ideas, ethics or how to live, sacrifice or giving back, the karmic circle, you know, how do you break the chain? How do you cut down that banyan tree? And another big problem is desire and ego. What binds us to this world? 
Then again, how to become free. So dedication. What frees us? And then another very big idea here in the third chapter is work and sacrifice. How do we make life sacred? And finally, uh, another big idea is the rejection of profit, the idea that we work for love or that we work without ego. So these are seven big ideas. You, you can find more, I'm sure. But uh, to try to give a summary of the third chapter, you can look at it like this. There's ethics, sacrifice, karmic circle, desire and ego, dedication, work in the sacrifice, and the rejection of profit. Now, some scholars, they like to think that each chapter of the Gita promotes an entirely separate idea, because the chapter titles were given long ago, maybe by Sridhar Swami, also uh, Shankara. Uh, we like to think, well, the first chapter is uh, Arjuna Vishada Yoga, and the second chapter is Sankhya Yoga, third chapter is Karma Yoga. But in a way, this is a bit reductionist. Uh, people who are opposed to the idea of Krishna Bhakti uh, as the central thesis of the Gita like to think that each chapter promotes an entirely separate idea and every idea is equal to every other idea. So karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, ashtanga yoga, it's all there. Take what you like, um, like a big buffet where you can take fruit or bread or whatever you like. Um, and since so many different conceptions of religion or dharma or yoga are found in the Gita, they think there's no central idea. But um, our school, which is the bhakti school, has a different position. And um, this school extends back to Sridhar Swami, perhaps the fifth or sixth century, to Ramanuja and Madhva, writing in the Middle Ages. And of course, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Sridhar Maharaj, Govinda Maharaj, uh, all have the same idea, and that is that all these different parts of the Bhagavad Gita add up to a whole, which is greater than the sum of its parts, and which represents the idea of divine love. Now, sometimes we try to look at the Bhagavad Gita in light of modern studies, but we can't hold the Gita to, to the same academic standards as a modern academic thesis with footnotes. It's a dialogue. It's in Upanishadic form. It's not a philosophical paper. So it's intellectually dishonest to try to tear the Gita into tiny sections, analyze the parts, and then say they don't really fit together into a larger thesis. Uh, it should be understood that even as Krishna presents these ideas like karma yoga or jnana yoga and different chapters of the Gita, he'll bring them together in later chapters. And as Madhusudana Maharaj will demonstrate when he begins speaking about the seventh chapter, Krishna's discussion on bhakti becomes more focused. And so Krishna never promotes the idea of merging into divinity or oneness. Because if we're all one, what would be the need of sacrifice to a higher power? But throughout the entire Gita, he, he maintains this distinction between the individual soul and the supreme soul. So in the third chapter, we're looking at the idea of sacrifice. And uh, sacrifice is a very simple uh, way of trying to give something back. I remember Sridhar Maharaj told me the story 
of a, a miser. A miser is someone who loves money so much that he won't spend it. Uh, and the miser was suffering. So he went to a, a sage and the sage, the wise man, told him, well, you have to give something back. You have to make some kind of sacrifice. Uh, if you begin with sacrifice, then you can move to the higher plane. And the man said, I can't do that. I don't know how to give anything. I can't. It's against my, my religion. And the, the wise man said, well, then you can practice your hand at giving ashes. You can find some worthless thing like ashes, and you can give that. And gradually by practicing uh, at giving something with no value, you will come to the point that you can give something. And as you learn to give, you can give more and more and more. And this is the very basis of the third chapter, how to give back, how to make some sacrifice. As you sacrifice more, you may come to the plane where you have faith and some higher authority and you can dedicate your life to God. And that's called bhakti. So you can trace a progression in the ideas of the Gita, especially from the third chapter, from a sort of general concept of dharma and sacrifice to karma yoga, then jnana yoga means your sacrifice is informed with a transcendental conception of the absolute and gradually move towards bhakti or dedication, first mixed with karma and jnana and finally unalloyed. So this does not mean that Krishna has advocated for each system along the way, but he's demonstrating a kind of gradation which uh, culminates in surrender. So, uh, Arjun, at the beginning of the third chapter, he tells Krishna, I don't really understand what you're saying. You're saying that I should understand about the soul. You're saying I should understand about the supreme soul. All right, well, if I'm going to meditate on God and the soul, why do I have to fight? This is contradictory. If you think that knowledge is better than action, why should I do this terrible action of participating in a horrible war? What do I have to do to achieve peace? How can I find peace by making war? This doesn't make any sense to me. So Krishna explains, well, there's two different ways to achieve peace. One is through meditation or contemplation, and the other one is through proper action. But in your case, you cannot stop acting. Uh, it's very difficult to be entirely inactive. Why would you even try? In fact, it's impossible. So try to understand the meaning of sacrifice, working without ego. Now, it's kind of interesting that Krishna says this, because this goes against uh, the current of our modern life. We live in a system of exploitation, where we think that karma is good. Uh, if you want to look at the result of karma, look at our overdeveloped capitalist countries where capitalism rel relies on what we call an enlightened self-interest to improve society. Uh, we work together, but our end is profit. We work together to exploit <coughs> nature, but uh, capitalism is a form of cannibalism. Uh, it's karmic exploitation on steroids. And this is driven by profit, which makes the system self-destructive. So our modern society 
has brought about impressive economic growth and social uh, opportunities for people, but it's also created uh, consequences. Uh, for example, global warming that have become too bigger for governments or society to handle. Uh, in a smaller economy, maybe we could work together. But in the system that we have, it's all about exploitation. And it doesn't matter if it's a socialist or capitalist system. It's all based on economic growth and, and exploitation which in a sense is the same thing as karma. Uh, capitalism believes that there's a thing called the labor theory of values. The more karma you put into something, the more it's worth. A tree then has no value. Uh, it's more valuable if you chop it down and make it into firewood. As a chair or a violin, it's more valuable still because it has more and more karma invested into it. So what Krishna is saying here is interesting because he says, we have to get rid of this profit mentality. We have to give something back. Begin uh, your life of perfection by giving something back to the universe, at least to the higher powers in, in the universe. Or as the sage told the, the miser, practice your hand at, at giving ashes in the beginning. And the idea is that if you practice giving of yourself, you'll discover that a higher truth exists and you'll find that your real self-interest is not money or profit, but your soul. So everyone's born for a life of activity. You can't deny that. Uh, but work done as sacrifice frees you from the reaction of work. Elevated souls, okay, Arjun doesn't like the idea of fighting in this war. He's thinking, well, what if I could just meditate? But that sort of path is not for everyone. So Krishna explains, elevated souls are beyond duty. They don't need to fulfill the duties assigned to them by society. Uh, we call these elevated souls avidutes. For example, Gorky Shuradas Babaji Maharaj or Sridhar Maharaj. Uh, they don't have to have a social security number or a retirement account. They're entirely dependent on Krishna for everything. But for those who are not self-realized, the proper therapy should be work and sacrifice. And this is what Krishna is advocating. He says, work and sacrifice will keep your passions in check. And this way you can control the senses and the mind. And um, it's important to control the senses and the mind. The way to do that is to give completely of yourself. But this is not really for everyone. Ordinary people have to follow their sensual appetites, and they're addicted to sense pleasure, and they can't free themselves from ego. And as long as you're a slave to your ego, you're thinking, how can I enjoy this body? What can I do to make my body happy? And this is the consumer society that we live in. So Arjun asks, uh, Krishna, he says, but why? If we're, if we're spiritually willing to dedicate ourselves to a higher path, why are we so weak? And Krishna says, well, it has to do with uh, kama or desire, because as long as you have an ego, you want things, and as long as you want things, you will be a slave to the senses. And if you can't get the things you want, then you'll become angry. 
And so driven by lust, anger, and greed, you won't be able to find out who you really are. But with the help of pure intelligence and transcendental knowledge, you should be able to control the mind and eliminate lust, anger, and greed that's born of desire. Otherwise, your perverted self-interest will lead you to perdition and hell. So uh, how to become free from desire? Krishna recommends what Srila Prabhupada used to call yukta vairagya, which means proper adjustment. It means you're not you're not of the marketplace. You may be in the marketplace, but you're working for a higher cause. Uh, you have to work to function in this world, but we're not supposed to be vampires who suck all the life out of the planet for a profit motive. So proper adjustment means engaging everything and everyone in the service of God without any selfish motive. So how do you know that you're doing this? How do you know that you're engaging things in the service of God? Or how do you know that you are involved in the service of God? Well, in the fourth chapter, Krishna tells us, you need the help of a guru. And in an ordinary sense, the guru is someone who is closer to God than you are. In a higher sense, Acharyavan Purusho Veda, the guru embodies the Vedic knowledge. Uh, He's the living Acharya, he's the example of dedication to Krishna. But you can start looking for someone who's closer to God than you are and serve that person until you can find someone who's even closer to God. If you're fortunate, you may come in contact with a Sridhar Maharaj or a Govinda Maharaj. Uh, so the third chapter is beginning with this question, if knowledge is better than work, if jnana is better than karma and dharma, why do we need to work at all? Or if we're spiritual souls, why get involved in karma at all? And then again, on a more practical level, what's the value of work? Well, our modern society defines the value of work in terms of money, but there has to be more than that. So, Krishna explains there's two classes of men who realize the truth. There's jnana yogis and karma yogis, but renunciation doesn't free you from karma. Again, think of this as like a, a banyan tree that's just growing everywhere. You try to renounce something for a while, it doesn't work. Later on, you want it again. It's the nature of renunciation, boga chag. I renounce something for a while and then I want it again. You can't avoid work. And if you try to renounce and you're still attracted to the objects of the senses, then you're just a fraud. So how do you control the senses in the mind? Try this idea of karma yoga. It's better to do what's yours than try some other path. That's not going to work. So do your duty. Otherwise, you can't maintain your body. But work must be done as a sacrifice. On a higher level, real surrender and devotion is uh, nirguna bhakti, ananya bhakti, but at least begin with sacrifice. Remember, bhoktaram jagya tapasam, Krishna says, I'm the ultimate beneficiary of sacrifice. So all sacrifice eventually flows toward Krishna. He says, I alone am the enjoyer and rewarder of sacrifice. Everything is done for me. God is by himself and for himself. So this is not unreasonable. Understanding reality in this way brings uh, surrender and faith. So we have to have some faith in the absolute, and that faith will lead us toward Krishna. But on a more primitive level. When work is done in sacrifice, the gods are pleased. And you have rain, heat, light, water, air, moonlight, rainfall. Otherwise, when no sacrifice is performed, your work is only exploitation 
then it will have a negative karmic effect. So if you look at the world that we're living in today, it's a world out of balance. It's not balanced because nothing is sacred. There's no sacrifice and everything is only exploitation. So why would you expect a positive result? On the other hand, Krishna says, if you do sacrifice to me and offer your food to me as prasadam, then you can become free from the karmic reaction. Whereas those who consume and eat only for personal enjoyment, they're really eating only sin. So this is all explained in the Vedas. The Vedas are the ancient instruction manual for spaceship Earth, for planet Earth. And enlightened beings, they understand this principle of sacrifice and act accordingly. This is a very revolutionary idea in a way. It's old school. Uh, since the time of uh, Nietzsche and the 19th century uh, philosophers like him, and then the existentialists, we really don't believe in anything. People say, well, you believe in that because it makes you feel good. And I believe in this, and this makes me feel good, so we're the same. But discarding ancient wisdom uh, on the basis of personal sense gratification is not a sustainable plan for yourself, your society, your community, or in the end, the planet. If you base everything on exploitation, you will get a negative result. Krishna says the wise who rejoice in the self, on the other hand, who are satisfied with uh, atmic realization, they're self-illuminated. Such fully God-conscious souls act in dedication to Krishna, the Lord of love. So because you're on a higher level, you're no longer under the trivial obligations of the ordinary strictures and duties of the Vedas. So since devotees are not interested in profit and exploitation, they have no love for sense pleasures like promiscuous sex, intoxication, gambling, meat eating, and other things. Uh, such a man or woman produces no karma, even though they work. So if you're working for Guru, Vaishnava, and Krishna, you're not producing any karma since your work is all dedication. And Krishna tells Arjuna, do your duty in this way. And don't be attached to the results. Uh, he says, even Janaka Maharaj and others became perfect through this sort of sacrifice and dedication. And you should lead the way because people will follow your example. Uh, as for me, I'm by myself and for myself. I'm the Supreme Personality of God. I have no duty prescribed for me. But even so, I'm active just to set the example. Because if I didn't do my duties, then all men would follow my example. And if I didn't set the example through work, uh, those who follow me would be ruined. So you can see even Krishna himself, he rules Dwarka. He takes part in the Kurukshetra war. He drives the chariot of Arjuna. He has no duty prescribed for him, but he's showing an example. But the difference is the ignorant, they want to profit from their work. They're attached to the results of their work. So how to work without personal profit? This is the idea. Uh, but this is not an easy path. So you may follow this path yourself, but you may find that if you try to explain this to others, uh, they may get angry. So the Bible says, don't uh, cast pearls before a swine. You can't try to convince everyone to be uh, a follower of this system of working and sacrifice. But you do it, ennoble your own life. Uh, and then Krishna becomes a little more metaphysical. 
And he says, after all, you're not the doer. Ahankara vimudatma, kartaham itimanyate. You think that you're the creator. Kartaham, uh, ahankara, creator. Uh, you think that you control everything, but this is a kind of God complex. You're entangled with an illusion. Uh, and this illusion develops through the interaction of ego and the different modes of nature or the or the gunas, prakriti kriyamanani, gunai karmani sarvasha, hankara vimudatma, kartaham iti manyate. It's a very good verse. And the Gita. The spirit soul, bewildered by the influence of false ego, thinks himself the doer of activities, which are in actuality carried out by the three modes of material nature. You're not really doing anything. Uh, you think that your life is unique. Uh, you're the only one in the world who uh, does what you do. But you're not. Your life is not so unique. Look around. You'll find that you're not really so original. Everyone winds up doing more or less the same things, eating, sleeping, mating, defending, uh, working. So why think that you're special? You're the center of the universe. Don't think like that. Try to become detached from this kind of thinking. And Krishna says, touch of it. Tu Mahabaho, Guna Karma Vibhagasha, Guna Gunesh Bhartanta, Iri Matvas Nasajate. So, on the other hand, one who's in knowledge of the absolute truth doesn't get so involved in the senses and sense gratification. He understands the difference between work for profit and uh, sacrificial work and devotion because he's guided by a bona fide spiritual master. But on the other hand, he says, prakriter guna samuda sajjante guna karmashu. The average person bewildered by false ego in the senses, engaged in this sort of hologram reality created with the help of maya and the material modes of nature, becomes attached and entrapped by ego and the senses. The ignorant become addicted to different levels of karmic activity for selfish profit. So there's different levels of attachment. Uh, there's uh, sattva, rajarshik, and tamasic karma. So sometimes you think, well, sattvic karma, that's good. I, I'll do benevolent or pious karma for the benefit of society and others. Uh, but it's something like if you're in a prison and you spend your time creating a beautiful garden in the prison, that's nice. Gardens are nice. They're beautiful. But why not try to get out of the prison? Rajarshik karma is passionate and creative karma done for personal profit. And then there's tamasic which is karma and darkness and ignorance done for selfish enjoyment. But all these different forms of selfish work are ego-based. They don't lead to any kind of enlightenment. They're a result of a lack of self-realization or laziness. And so uh, Arjun is told, don't be like that. Don't in ignorance, renounce your work, but surrender your work to me. You understand the position of the soul and the super soul. You understand my position as the supreme personality of Godhead. So give up your desire for profit. Give up your claims for treasure and royal splendor. Your duty is to fight. So, of course, we're not Arjun. We're not on a battlefield, but in a lot of ways, um, our life is a struggle. Our life is a battle. Sometimes we think, why am I doing this? The example is given of uh, Sisyphus in ancient Greek mythology. Uh, Sisyphus offended the gods. So he was condemned to roll a rock up to the top of a mountain. 
And as soon as the rock got to the top of the mountain, it fell back down onto the other side. And this is given as an example of the uselessness of our daily life. Uh, we're stuck doing the same things every day. You have to uh, make the bed and put your shoes on. You have to wash the dishes. Uh, you have to get a haircut. And these things are useless because in one week, you have to do it again. Uh, women sometimes complain about the uh, work done in the house because it's just a never-ending battle against dirt and dust. And you can sweep today, but you have to sweep tomorrow too. You can wash the dishes today, but you have to wash the dishes tomorrow. You can wash the clothes and iron the clothes today, but you have to do the same thing again tomorrow. When does it end? Uh, but the idea is if your work is done as a sacrifice to God, then your work ennobles you. If the man who rolls the rock up to the top of the hill only to see it roll down to the other side, if every time he does that, he dedicates the rock and his action to God and Krishna, uh, then he'll find that his work is joyful. So even things that are apparently useless or a struggle, a battle, uh, take on a higher meaning when they're done in sacrifice. It's basically the idea of the third chapter. Uh, so this is how you become free from karma, by dedicating your work to God. And Krishna says, those who disrespect these teachings, thinking that they're trivial, are foolish. So now in our 21st century, nothing is sacred. The word sacrifice and the word sacred are related Sacrifice means to make something sacred. So if nothing is sacred, there is no God, there is no soul. The only thing is to satisfy our senses and maybe take care of our families. We're no better than animals because the animals also take care of their families. The birds make beautiful nests. You can see funny videos of cats and dogs on YouTube where they, they take care of their families. They love their families. But there has to be something more to human life. Otherwise, we're no more than animals. And Krishna here says, uh, you're foolish. You may try to give up work or do some partial version of sacrifice, uh, thinking that you can control the mind and senses and just go on enjoying life. This is a little, I like to tell a story about uh, the man who, dies and he goes to heaven and he's at the the gates of saint peter and saint peter stands at the door and he says what can i do for you and the man says well <clears throat> i'm here i'm here i'm ready to come into heaven saint peter says well what's your name and the man says uh chakravarti okay just let me check here I'm looking in the book. I'm looking in the book. I don't see your name here in the book. I'm sorry. You have to go to the other place. What? That's not possible. Look again. I looked. You're not in the system. The system says you can't come in. And the man says, well, we'll talk to him. Talk to God. What do I tell him? He says, uh, well, I used to give. I used to go to church every Sunday, and every Sunday I gave $10 in the church. He says, okay. So St. Peter goes to God, and uh, God is busy watching the football. He doesn't know what to do because uh, Liverpool has a lot of people praying. Oh, God, please let Liverpool win. And Manchester United has a lot of people praying, oh, God, please let Manchester United win. So God's watching the football, and he's trying to understand, well, you know, whose prayers should I satisfy? And St. Peter comes to him and says, uh, there's a man at the door. And God says, so what? What do you want me to do about that? Uh, well, he says he gave uh, money at the church. Oh, yeah. 
Is his name in the book? No, his name's not in the book. His name's not in the book. Well, God says, then give him his money back and tell him to go to hell. So the idea that we can satisfy God by offering something insignificant every now and then, while we go on enjoying our senses and uh, really exploiting the world, this is not a good idea. It doesn't raise us to the highest level. So this sort of plan of uh, repressing the mind and senses and doing some sort of partial version of sacrifice doesn't really bring us to the highest level. Uh, sooner or later, your desires will come back to haunt you and you'll be stuck in the, the circle of repeated birth and death or samsara. So even a man in knowledge will follow his nature. You can't repress your nature. So he's telling Arjun, even if you understand transcendental knowledge, you're a warrior. That's who you are. That's what you do. So on some level, you're forced to do what you do, even if you know something higher. But the point is, do it in sacrifice. Do it for Krishna. So he's, the problem then comes down to the senses. Uh, the, but the senses can be regulated by following principles. Krishna tells Arjuna, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. So do what you do. And then Arjuna wants to know, well, then tell me, if the spirit is willing, why is the flesh so weak? What is it that drives us to sin as if we're impelled by force? And uh, then Krishna gives a very nice uh, explanation. He says, uh, Kama Esha, Krota Esha, Raja Guna Samudbhava, Mahasho, Mahashano, Mahapatma, Vijenam, Ikhavairinam. He says, It's lust. Uh, the real enemy of the world is not external, but internal. The bewildered souls are driven by lust, anger, and greed. So lust comes out of contact with Rajaguna, which is the mode of passion. And later, this becomes transformed into anger and greed and hate. And in this way, the soul is overcome by these enemies. And this is interesting to me also because here we find a difference between Christian theology and the understanding or wisdom of the Vedas. Uh, Christianity believes in original sin. That means we're all bad. You're bad, I'm bad. We're all driven by terrible desires because we have original sin on our soul. Uh, because in the Garden of Eden, uh, Eve stole an apple from the tree of knowledge and gave its fruit to Adam. So because we're all taking part in the forbidden fruit, our soul is stained with sin from the moment that we're born. This is why in the Catholic Church, they like to baptize babies very, very young to remove the stain of the original sin. But the Vedic concept doesn't have this idea of original sin. It doesn't have the idea that the soul doesn't emerge until baptism or that we're covered by original sin. The idea is that as the soul falls into the material energy, the light of the soul is darkened. So Krishna here gives the example of uh, fire covered by smoke, a mirror covered by dust, 
or the embryo covered by the womb. But the idea here is um, a mirror covered by dust, you can still make out a reflection of the soul, but it's a dim reflection. Uh, fire covered by smoke, you can still see the fire and you can get light and heat from it. So the idea is that as fire is covered by smoke, the soul is covered by sattva gun. We can still see the light. A mirror covered by dust, the soul is covered by the mode of passion, or rajaguna. You can still make out the reflection of the soul, but it's a dim reflection. Whereas the mode of darkness is tamaguna. In the mode of tamaguna, one is so covered, they're like an embryo hidden in the womb. In other words, the soul is there, but you can't see it. You can't detect it. It's like completely covered by the womb. So in this way, the living entity is covered by different levels of ignorance. It's not a question of being stained by sin, but being covered by different levels of ego-based desire. And this is the true enemy of the soul, then, the ego-based desire. And Krishna says, this burns like fire. He says, avritam jnanam etena jnanino nitya varina kama rupena konteya dushpurun nalanena cha. Thus the wise living entity's pure consciousness becomes covered by his eternal enemy in the form of lust, which is never satisfied and which burns like fire. So then Krishna wraps up his argument. He says, so remember that the working senses are better than dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is higher than the mind. And the soul is above the intelligence. So we have these different levels of engagement with what we call uh, the material energy. The closest to the soul is intelligence. So we try to awaken some pure knowledge of the soul because that knowledge will help guide us. But in terms of ethics or action, try to couple your action with the idea of sacrifice. Uh, Krishna says then, tasmat tvam indriyanyadu niyamya bharatarshava patmanam prajahi jnanam jnana nashanam. This is so in the very beginning, you need to curb lust by regulating the senses. And this way, uh, put an end to that thing which is destroying your knowledge and self-realization. And finally, he ends his chapter by saying, evam buddhe paramudva sangshtabhyatma manam what? sangshtabhyatma Manamatmana. Jahi Shatra Mahabahu Kama Rupam Durasara. He says, knowing yourself to be transcendental to the material senses, mind, and intelligence, study the mind by deliberate intelligence and thus with spiritual strength control uh, this enemy, which is Kama, lust. You can translate kama as lust, uh, but another way to look at it is desire. So what's keeping you what's keeping you from sacrifice is uh, the desire to do something for yourself, which is ego. But this is a hunka, it's false ego. You're not thinking about who you really are or what your real self-interest is. Your real self-interest is to become reunited with God. And what keeps you separate from God, that's false ego. So why serve those desires? So leave aside lust through sacrifice. This is basically the, the concept that Krishna is putting forward in the, in the third chapter. So you can say, well, this is, you know, this is not really bhakti. It's not the highest thing. But Krishna is really just opening his argument here. He still has 15 uh, chapters left 
to go. He's stating a kind of a basic promise. Okay, so so there we are. <clears throat> I did one hour and summarized. I try to summarize the contents of the third chapter. The third chapter is very straightforward. Uh, the problem is accepting the teaching. If I tell you, uh, okay, that's very easy. Give up your ego. Oh, okay. Well, what does it say in the fourth chapter? Same thing. What does it say in the fifth chapter? Same thing. But we're using different words and putting things a little more differently. Give up the ego. So Srila Prabhupada used to say, it's difficult to wake up a man who's pretending to be asleep. If you're asleep and somebody rings the bell, you, oh, you wake up. But if you're pretending to be asleep, it doesn't matter how much they ring the bell. So if I tell you, that's why Krishna uses the word mudha. Mudha means uh, a donkey. Here in Mexico, if a student is a burro, it means they're not moving. They know where they're supposed to go. The burro knows exactly where he's supposed to go. He's supposed to, he has a big burden on his back and he has to walk 10 miles. So he's like, I'm not going to do that. But he pretends, oh, I don't really understand you. What are you trying to say? So it's the, the Bhagavad Gita's big, big mystery. Give up your ego. Oh, really? Oh, gee. Let me study um, uh, Vedic cooking, you know? Let me study uh, a new yogic position. Ah, that helps. But giving up the ego, it's not an option. We're living in a society where the worst possible thing you could do would be to give up your ego. They'll put you in the, in the manicomio. They'll put you in the in the, the nut house, the insane asylum. They'll put you in a mental hospital. What? You're giving up your ego? You're not allowed to do that. Join the line. March. One, two, three, four. So if you're forced into a position where you have to march with the other people because there will be severe punishments if you don't, then... Okay, join the lion. But internally, do it as a sacrifice to Krishna. That's what he's saying. Everything can be done as a sacrifice to Krishna. We think, well, it's devotional service if I bring flowers to the temple and put that on the altar. Because there's an obvious connection. There's the deity. There's Krishna. Here's my flowers. I'm giving that. So there, I did my sacrifice. But giving up the ego is much more difficult. D dedicating your ego to guru and Vaishnava, much more difficult. Try it. You'll like it. Okay? Thank you. I, I don't know if you want me to. I like taking questions because it's more dynamic. I don't like just blah, 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 because everybody goes to sleep. So does anyone have a question? I. Uh Yes, if anybody has questions, um, you can write them in the chat or you can give some signal, then we turn on your sound. And actually, uh, Prabhu, I have a question. Right. Um, I have a question. Uh, okay. In the third chapter, there is a shloka, you were speaking about it, that uh, every action actually is done by gunas by Raja Guna, Tama Guna, and Sattva Guna, yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the yeah. question is, if every action is performed by Gunas, why, why do we need to have karmic reaction? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting philosophical question, right? So Krishna appears to be saying here that you're not doing anything. Right? It's the material nature. Prakriti krimanani gunai karmani sarvasha. Hankara vimudatma. We're bewildered. We're just in false ego. Everything's being run. But, you know, you are an individual, jiva soul. You have free will. And your free will is engaging with the world in a karmic way. So, you, the thing is, 
you don't, you say you don't want the reaction, but you do. You're begging for the reaction, right? You go to a, an employer and you say, I will, I will give you 40 hours of my action and I want 40 hours worth of reaction from you. How much reaction do I get? And the employer said, well, okay, we'll give you $20 an hour. And you say, no, 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 I want more reaction. Give me $25 an hour. And the employer will say, well, okay, for your karma, we'll give you so much karmic reaction in the form of dollars. Are you happy now? No, I want more reaction. So then, uh-oh, guess what? The reaction came to you. And you say, no, 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 this part I don't want. That's bad. I only want the good reaction. So, you know, your body and senses are engaging in the world and getting a reaction from that. Uh, is it a real reaction? No. In the end, it's kind of Maya. Why? Because the soul is eternal and the body and senses are temporary. So it's not really real. Uh, there's a, a thing in medicine, I forget, it's called the false, the false limb syndrome, right? If you lose an arm from some accident or in a war or something, you can still feel the arm there, but it's not there. So how real are our senses? We can still feel them even when they're not there. Uh, if you close your eyes, can you see color? No, there's no light. You can't see color. And yet, when I don't know about you, but when I dream, I always dream in color. I, I wake up and I remember, ah, she was wearing a yellow sweater. That girl in my dream, boy, she was so beautiful. She was blonde. She was wearing a yellow sweater. Now, how can I see a yellow if there's no light? I can't. It's in my imagination. So is the mind in the world or is the world in the mind, right? So our karmic reaction, the, if Krishna is telling you what you're doing in the world kind of doesn't really exist because it's just false ego interacting with the modes of nature. And your question is, well, how do you get a karmic reaction from that? You know, it's, there's nothing there. It's... Uh, the modes of nature are working. Yeah, but it's kind of like in your dream, the yellow sweater is real. You know, it's kind of illusory and kind of not. We don't hold with the idea that the world is entirely Maya. That's the Mayavadi idea. But there's some reality to the subjective reality. And it's real enough. Right? If you cut me, I will bleed. If you punch me in the nose, I will feel pain. So I'm not denying the existence of the world. I'm just saying the world is there as some kind of an action and reaction between this false ego I've partly created, partly enforced by the Paramatma, partly enforced by Maya the three gunas, sattva, rajas, and tamas. There's some very real interaction going on there, and the karmic reaction is also real. I, I don't know, does that answer your question? Um, it's, it's, it's a little more subtle. That's why I said, think, don't think so much of like, uh, you know, a baseball and a bat. The pitcher throws the bat at excuse me, pitcher throws the ball at 90 miles an hour. It reaches home plate a second later. The batter hits the ball at 100 miles an hour. How fast does the ball go? What's, it, what's, it, what's the velocity of the ball as it hits a spectator in the, uh, in the arena? five seconds later. You can calculate all that. It's very simple action and reaction. It's physics. 
It's fun to do. People who love science, they love that stuff, right? But think of a banyan tree. You can't predict, you can't predict where the next root comes from or where the next branch goes out. It's an organic thing. It's living. So is karma kind of illusory? Yeah, it kind of is, you know? Things that are very important to you right now, and I know this because I'm old, right? Things that are incredibly important to you right now. What to name your baby, you know? Uh, what color car are you going to drive? 40 years from now, you look back at that and go, yeah, I named him Bob, but he likes people to call him Hacker. Or, you know, we named her Margarita, but she goes by Rita. And I named her Margarita because my grandma, blah, blah, blah. But the importance of physical action and reaction will fade into memory, even in this lifetime. What to speak of over eternity. So... If, but that's a very powerful verse in the Gita. I really like that. You know, prakriti kriyamana. You know, this material nature, kriyamana. You know, where there's action and reaction, gunai uh, karmani sarvashaha. It's all the modes of nature interacting with ahankara vimudatma, this ego trip that we're on. So is it real after all? Yeah, it is. That's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says. He's a fan of a chintya beta beta tattva. He says it's real and it's not real at the same time, but you have to take it seriously. Very strange. This life is real. You have to take it seriously. Don't think that your friends are Maya. Right? These people in, in the Zoom class, they don't really exist. Yes, they do. You know, my children, uh, you know, who cares? I'm just going to, that's some weird, these children are just two weird karmic reactions that I have that are wandering around in the universe. It's not me. I don't have to deal with that. Yes, you do. Krishna says, do it. Do your karma. Do your dharma. But what's the difference? Do it for me. It's a very strange idea. Sacrifice. Don't be an egotist. That's really hard. Uh, you do things as a devotee, right? You give your life to the Krishna consciousness movement. You go out uh, and collect money for Guru and Vaishnava. I used to collect in Calcutta. It was lots of fun. I remember when I... Uh, it was at the Mat of Sri Ramarsh. When I took sannyas, actually, they sent me to Calcutta. I had to collect. So I'm going from cloth shop to cloth shop. And I showed them a book, a guy, Back to Godhead magazine or whatever it was. Uh, and the first reaction of the Babu, the guy who runs the cloth shop, is, I, I know what I have and I saw it, I read it. I'm like, um, excuse me, sir, we're here on behalf of the Sri Chaitanya Saraswat, I know it, I have it, I saw it, I read it. Okay, but um, I know it, I have it, I saw it, I read it. Oh, okay. Then I go to the next place. And some people were really, really, really expert. They'd come back at the end of the day with 2,000 rupees. And I would come back with like 10 rupees and just completely crushed you know, my ego completely destroyed. But maybe the point of the lesson was to destroy my ego a little bit, you know. I don't know. But you do stuff like that. Maybe you collect $100,000 a day and you do it for 20 years. At the end of the 20 years, what do you have? Nothing. Nobody's giving you part of that money. Why? You're giving it to the temple. That's for Guru and Krishna and Vaishnava. You get nothing. Well, you can turn around and look back on your devotional life and say, wow, how is it possible? Now I'm old. I don't have any teeth. Uh, I have a heart condition. I don't have medical insurance. Uh, was that a smart thing to do? I should have. Why didn't I ask uh, Sridhar Maharaj for a dental plan? 
right? I should have said, listen, before I surrender here, uh, do you have dental? Do you have a medical plan? You know, but you can't do that. You just give yourself. And you can't be a miser in terms of sacrifice. Uh, Sri Ramars used to say, you know, uh, it said, no risk, no gain. All right, everybody understands that. If you, if you don't risk something, you're not going to get anything. Okay, no risk, no gain. Okay. Some risk, some gain. I can accommodate that. Maybe I don't always get something, but I get something. But what about uh, all risk, all gain? I surrender everything, and I get the supreme personality of Godhead. Wow. I surrender myself completely, and I get the infinite. There's a noble goal to be achieved. And then he chuckled a little bit, and he said, but what about all risk, no gain? You give everything, and Krishna turns his back on you. As Krishna disappeared from the rasa dance, uh, the participants in the rasa dance, they're higher than the highest Vedic philosophers, the gopis of Vrindavan. They've given everything. They've risked their reputations. And there they are with Krishna dancing in the forest. And suddenly Krishna disappears. So they've given everything and they got nothing. All risk, no gain. Can you accommodate that? So there's no guarantee that through surrender, you get anything. A lot of people like the idea. I was talking to a sannyasi there at that beta life that we went to in Ukraine. And he was explaining the Bhakti Ras Samrita Sindhu to me of Rupa Goswami in terms of this is a process. You follow the process, you get the result. It, but this is not a mechanistic concept that we're subscribing to. It's not a process, right? Ado, Shraddha, Tato, Sadhu, Sangha, like that. First, there's some faith. Then you find the devotees and you surrender. You get a guru. The guru teaches you the process. You follow sadhana bhakti. You come up to uh, ruchi. You get a taste. And then sadhana bhakti leads to raga bhakti. And then you discover bhava, which is a really higher taste. But what if, what if you fall in love? And according to the Shastra, there's 64 loving arts. You fall in love with someone. So you write them a poem and you bring them flowers and you offer them food and you offer them incense and you dance for them and you offer them prayers and you serve them and you do archanam and vandanam and parasavanam. And then it's not interested in you. <laughs> What's the guarantee? If you fall in love and you give love, what's the guarantee? There's no guarantee. It's not a process. You know, it's love. The, the goal of love is love. The goal of love is not to bring you under control so you do what I want. So some people look at bhakti like that. They think, if I offer love to God, then I can bring God under control and God will be my slave. But there's no guarantee. You're jumping off the precipice. You're diving deep into the infinite. You don't know what's there. But on the other hand, a man is judged by his high, or woman, judged by the high ideal. So there was a a man pulling a barge up the Ganges and uh, praying to God. So Narada Muni, or Brahma, the creator, I forget the story, appears to him and says, what do you want, man? I will give you anything. I see you're working very hard. You're pulling this barge up the river. Your back is raw. 
Your feet are torn. You're pulling on this rope. I will give you anything. What do you want? And the man says, well, what I would like very much is if you could put mattresses on the road so that as I'm pulling the barge, I can walk on these mattresses and they'll be nice and soft. And Brahma, the creator, says, done, and gives him mattresses. But he doesn't think to ask for something better. So someone is known by their high ideal. Uh, Prabhupada, now when I look back on this story, I think, really? Shoot the rhinoceros? But, you know, if you know the old Prabhupada stories, you've heard this before. Prabhupada would say, shoot for the rhinoceros, right? If you kill a rabbit, there's no credit, right? But if you shoot the rhinoceros, now you've got something. Of course, in our day and age, it's not a very politically correct thing. But Dostoevsky used to say, I wish I had created Don Quixote. My characters are all sort of twisted people. But Cervantes created Don Quixote, who is a fool, who is suffering in this world. Uh, he doesn't, he's actually a madman. Uh, he thinks he's a comic book character. He thinks he's a knight in shining armor. But he's just an old man with a nag. Uh, but Don Quixote has this high ideal. He's, he wants to live in the golden age. He wants to right the wrongs and save damsels in distress. So Don Quixote is the greatest figure in literature ever invented because he has a high ideal. He wants to do something that nobody else can do. So everybody loves his character. Of course, that's a bit superficial. Even better, uh, if you think about sacrifice, Jesus Christ, he sacrificed everything. He sacrificed himself to save the sins of the world. So sacrifice is a high ideal, and it makes you work noble. Why should we not then look back to the ancient wisdom of the Gita to guide us through this dark night of the soul in our uh, post-apocalyptic uh, post uh, zombie dark universe of internet madness? You know, what's wrong with looking to Krishna for some guidance? even on a very superficial level, just to dismiss the Bhagavad Gita because, oh, it's just some weird Hindu thing. And you know, I know about the Hindus. They got like thousands of gods, Shiva and all that, you know, whatever. Just to dismiss ancient wisdom because it's, it's not what you saw on Facebook this morning. You know, it's a very foolish position. Anyways, I, I'm sorry. I'm talking, waiting for the next question, if there is any. Um, I, I apologize for talking too much. Forgive me. No, no, I love I'm everybody happy. here, and thanks a lot for participating, by the way. Yeah? Yes. We have anything thank, else? Thank you very much. Everything is very interesting. Actually, we have more questions, but uh, they are not... Um about the third chapter, there are, qu no, there are well, go ahead. questions go ahead. in general. Okay, so, so there is a question from Saum Yashyam Prabhu from Orsk. Uh, there are two questions from him. Uh, the first, first question is, what happens with the soul after, after the death? And the second question is... Okay, well, but, but the question answers that in the eighth chapter of the Gita, where he says, according to what you remember at the time of death, that will determine your next life. I forget the exact shloka, but it's the eighth chapter. Yeah. Okay. Next and question. The second question is, how it will be, um, how, how should we direct our soul in the correct way to the Lord? That's a question from your guru. Okay. <laughs> I, I knew that that would come up. That's a very logical point. 
Okay, so then. That's all. <laughs> so then, you know, if, if the question is, all right, we're supposed to sacrifice ourselves. We're supposed to dedicate ourselves to Krishna. Well, what I did, my friend, Somya Sham, uh, I read this book. And I thought, wow, that's heavy. So who's, who's he? I want to know him. So I went to Los Angeles and uh, surrendered. And I said, when can I see him? And they said, well, he'll be coming here in uh, August or September. And I said, I have to wait until then. Oh, no, really? Hmm, okay. So I surrendered myself to the Los Angeles temple and did what they told me to do. And then Srila Prabhupada, you know, came there. And at that time, he was so famous and surrounded by people. I didn't get a chance to really talk to him personally. But I took his teaching seriously. And I did what I was asked to do for the Krishna movement. And after Prabhupada disappeared, I, I went and found Sri Maharaj. And Sri Maharaj taught me something about the Bhagavad Gita. But in terms of real practical action, right, what do we do? You have to ask your guru, what service can you, what, what service can I do for you? How can I help you? Uh, Chidananda Prabhu, he took sannyasi, became, I think, it was Sanyasi Maharaj, but his name before was Chidananda Prabhu. Uh, he used to live in Los Angeles. He's walking down the street one day, and there was Srila Prabhupada with her, his Mercedes Benz, and uh, the car was broken down. So Chidananda saw, here's this old Indian sadhu with a big car. And he walked over to him and he said, what, what's the problem? I know how to fix cars. Let me look at it. Siddhanti Maharaj, thank you. Siddhanti Maharaj. Yeah, I thought it was Sanyasi Maharaj. I knew him as Chidananda. So from Chidananda to Siddhanti. Nice choice. Anyway, he asked uh, Srila Prabhupada, what can I do for you? How can I help you? So that should be the attitude. Approach your guru and ask him that. And as far as the first question, uh, eighth chapter, Krishna says, yam yam vapi smaran bhavam chajati ante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kantiya saratad bhava bhavita. Whatever you think of when you quit your body, whatever you remember, that state you will attain without fail. So if you're chanting Hare Krishna and thinking of Krishna at the time of death, you, know, you should go with Krishna, we think. Yeah, anything else? Um, uh, no, no, there are no questions from the chat. Uh, um, Virachandra okay. Prabhu wrote a premium Siddhanti Maharaj. Yeah, right. I always knew him as Chidananda, and later mm -hmm. I heard he became Siddhanti, so Chidanand Siddhanti. But yeah, he was, a, he was a great soul. I loved him a lot. We shared a room in the Mat in uh, Navadweep. And he told me the story how he, that's how he met Srila Prabhupada, he fixed his car. I was like, hmm, we need to make an adjustment here and, and the carburetor, and there you go, that should work for you. You want to hear more stories. That's why we have the Puranas. See, the Gita is kind of Upanishadic. It means it's more, it's more f philosophical, right? Whereas the Puranas tell nice stories, and we can think, oh, yeah, we understand the ideas of karma and things like that by the stories that are told. So stay tuned to this channel. And we'd like to thank Chintamani Devi Dasi, Suvashini is here, Soumya Sham, William Parks, or Beer Chandra, oh. it's also known, right? Stories with me and the devotees. <laughs> well, Ananda Lila, Mira, Maravilata, Lubov Khortitska, Lilavati, Yekaterina, Kolom, Mietz, and R.M. Das of Lvov or Lviv. There he is. That's William Parks. Oh, it's good to see you, my friend. 
How are you? You okay? Is everything all right? You're looking good. You always have such a big smile, you know? It, it gives me, <laughs> yeah, it gives me heart and cheer and warmth to see you, you know? Such a bomb at Didi, ahí en Bonita Morelia, México, Tapanandini, does the Merida Yucatan, huh? con el calor de el Yucatan, Nama Priya. Of course, Prana, she's from the Emerald Isle. He's front and center there. It's good to see you, my man. And uh, Praneshwari and Jai Dave. And of course, Har Harimati, I can see she. She's making a translation while I'm talking, which is, I don't know. That's a very, very difficult thing to do, simultaneous translation. It's hard for me because I'm a writer, so I think, you know, and I think, what's a good word here? You know, dedication or devotion? Shall we say, how do we say bhakti? Is it dedication or is it? And, and when I'm stuck thinking like that, Two minutes went by, and, you know. Goswami Maharaj is very quick, you know. He's like rock, and I'm kind of roll. <laughs> he's rock, I'm roll. <laughs> but he's very, very quick, you know. Where I have to take my time and think about it. So that's why I like writing. But anyways, thank you all very much for joining us today. If you like the talk, uh, help Braja Sundari. She's trying to promote the Bhagavad Gita. Later on, we'll have Madhusudana Maharaj on here. We'll have uh, uh, Devashish Prabhu. And I'm sure other things. But it's nice to bring together uh, an international community of devotees like you all. It's a very wonderful thing, and the COVID virus is terrible, but your association gives me heart and keeps me alive, so I, I can't thank you enough. I love you all very much. Uh, peace, love, Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you, Mahavri Prabhu. <laughs> Please accept our other senses. Uh, so, Dr. Brenda Kijai. So we will see you next week on Friday, and uh, you will speak with us about the fourth chapter, yes? That's right. We're trying to do a chapter a week, which is really a big, it's a big challenge because I like all the verses in the Bhagavad Gita, you know? I don't like to just try to do 40 verses in one sitting, but... You asked, so I'm trying to do as you asked. All right, I'm going to leave the meeting now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Jai Mahagi Prabhu Ki Jai. Hare Krishna. Please accept our businesses. Bye-bye.